prehistoric cave painting to Greek architecture to the planes flying overhead, humans have looked to nature for inspiration for millennia. But did you know the word biomimicry, the way we've been copying nature, has only been around for the last 50 years or so? We'll find out more about it on this episode of Sustainable Energy. Welcome to the Greek Cyclades Islands. I'm Asha and I've come here to meet a biomimicry expert, Alessandro Bianciardi. I'll ask him how design and innovations that mimic mother nature can make the planet more sustainable. Also coming up on the show. We take you through some facts and figures on bio-inspired innovations that combine efficiency with sustainability. We head to Rotterdam and Vancouver, where two biomimicry experts are proposing to use algae and circadian rhythms to reduce the impact of light pollution and keep people healthy. The way we're treating light right now, and especially in cities, is, is really bad. And later we go to Sweden to meet veteran architect Anders Newquist. He's taken nature-based inspiration from termite mounds to design ventilation systems. Very simple, natural ventilation. One way mimicking nature could be handy is when it comes to managing carbon emissions. As nature has already proven, it can do it better than us. According to a report by the University of Davis in California, 55% of carbon sequestration is done naturally by the environment. And here's what else we can learn about biomimicry. Since life first appeared on planet Earth around 3.8 billion years ago, nature has been developing its own solutions to challenges, whether it's flying, energy-saving solutions, CO2 processing through photosynthesis, and many more. Meanwhile, UN reports show that humans may be creating problems for nature with industrial systems, leading to rising temperatures, pollution, and biodiversity loss. So to achieve goals set up by the Paris Agreement to combat climate change and move towards a more sustainable future, the UN says we need a new technology framework. And that is where biomimicry comes in. Experts suggest our systems could work hand in hand with natural systems. Janine Benayas is the biologist and designer who popularized the concept of biomimicry in 1997. I think people are going to biomimicry for the sustainability win but they stay because of the novelty. Because what they found is category disrupting platform technologies. Examples of sustainable innovations using nature can be found all over the world. The design of Japan's Shinkansen bullet train was inspired by owl feathers, penguins, and the kingfisher's beak to reduce the sonic boom when the train entered tunnels. And why do you think it's called the World Wide Web? Bio-inspired innovations could account for $1.6 trillion of the global gross domestic product by 2030. It could also save money. The same study claims resource and pollution mitigation could amount to another half a trillion dollars. But to reach that goal, biomimicry experts say collaboration between scientists, designers, engineers and policymakers is key. I've crossed to the island of Tinos to see biomimicry in action and to meet Alessandro Bianciardi, our expert for this show. He runs a bio-inspired desalination project here. Alessandro, thank you for having us here today. You're welcome, Aisha. Can you tell us a little bit about this place and the project you're running here? Yes, this is a project called the Mangrove Technology Platform, you can see here. And it's a project that actually was funded by the European Union. We call it the Mangrove Technology Platform because we take indeed inspiration from the mangrove, mangrove ecosystems. Itself. They grew up in, uh, in saline water. And in this type of ecosystem, the mangrove trees is the first one that colonized uh, an empty coast because it has the capacity to desalinate water. And as it grows, it creates conditions conducive for other species to come, which uh, slowly and uh, together, they build up an entire ecosystem where before there was none. 
So the idea here, the analogy, is to reproduce this type of process, but with technologies. So this is what you're doing here? Basically, what we did, we took an already existing uh, process, which is called the solar steel, which is run by, by, by the sun, and we improved the design, um, looking at how nature, uh, like, for example, like plants, they absorb uh, light, how they use the capillarity to suck water up, so without pumping uh, systems, and also how certain organisms, they regulate temperature, or they are able to absorb moisture from the from the air. So the water goes in here? The water goes in here, it gets evaporated during the day with the sun and it gets condensed in the internal part of the glass and it gets collected. So you have fresh water coming out from here. It's very important because it allows to utilize saline water to grow crops and eventually in other location it could be used to regenerate land where land basically is not productive anymore. What does biomimicry mean for you? As an environmental engineer working on a sustainable development project, I was always looking for a holistic approach to solve this type of uh, challenges. So almost 10 years ago, I started to train myself in this uh, discipline which led me to a PhD program at the Politecnico di Milano. And I co-founded the company Planet, which is fully dedicated to bioinspire design. I've read about many projects like this one that are at the prototype stage. Why do you think it's difficult to get bio-inspired projects beyond that stage? First of all, when you try to emulate nature, you must be aware that uh, sometimes natural processes are done at small scales and in milder condition than the one that uh, are needed for our society. So what happens is that sometimes when you try to scale up natural process, you are not able to reproduce that. Another issue for me is that uh, nature can inspire you to find uh, radical solutions, solutions to problems. And generally, these are done in academic sector or young startup that they have uh, great ideas. But of course, they find the, the usual obstacles that radical products have in entering the market. What areas of expertise are needed to take bio-inspired projects to the next stage? Well, biomimicry, uh, by definition, let's say, is a multidisciplinary practice. Definitely, it's advisable to bring biologists uh, to the process because they know they can uh, indicate you which are the best natural models that you can emulate. And then it depends on the type of problems that you have to solve. If it's a technical problem, then you will need engineers, designers, architects, if it's a social problem, because biomimicry can be applied also to solve social problems, then maybe you need other expertise like planners, uh, social scientists, economists. Thank you, Alessandro. You're welcome, Aisha. We'll take a quick break, but up next, we see how nature can offer solutions to reduce problems caused by artificial light. We should have trees that glow at night to replace street lights. Welcome back to Sustainable Energy. Today we meet innovators who have been inspired by plants and animals to design the world of tomorrow. A world that perhaps could do with better lighting methods. You might have heard of the term light pollution. It turns out it's about more than just not being able to see the stars at night. It's posing a threat to our ecosystems and even to human health. But some people are working on it. Take a look. The impact of artificial light on wildlife and the environment has recently appeared on the United Nations agenda. In 2020, the UN stated it can disrupt photosynthesis and severely affect animal activity. And we humans are simply not programmed to receive that much light at night. We evolved as hunter-gatherers around the equator on the plains. We were exposed to bright daylight for at least 12 hours a day. And then at night, with the exception of orange firelight and, say, the moonlight, we were exposed to darkness. Exposure to artificial lighting has been increasing since the invention of the light bulb, and studies have shown that too much night exposure can stop the production of melatonin, a hormone produced in pitch darkness that doesn't only help us sleep better. 
Melatonin is a hormone that prepares our brain and body for sleep. It does other things as well. For example, it, it plays a role in the process of identifying cancer cells and targeting them for destruction. So it's a really important hormone. Glenn Landry promotes a return to more natural lighting systems using technology available to us, but that can also mimic the sun cycles. He's been advising Sarah Morgan, an industrial designer who has developed a tunable lighting system that adjusts the light spectrum to human needs using some very small particles. We use quantum dots. They are nanocrystals, and when they're excited, they give off energy in the form of light. So when I turn this UV light onto the quantum dots, you can see that they are emitting at incredibly high efficiency. We use these materials in our lighting systems and we modulate the amount of light that they emit throughout the day in order to emulate sunlight. And for Sarah, the future of sustainable lighting is not made of light bulbs. Our focus as a company is programmable paint. So with every iteration of our technology, we're moving closer and closer to embedding quantum dots into our walls so that we can emulate sunlight moving through the room throughout the day the way that it would if sunlight was coming in through the window. New technologies, new supports, and new visions. Dutch artist Dan Roosgaarder has also been looking for ways to minimize the use of artificial lighting in nature. The way we're treating light right now, and especially in cities, is really bad. It's not energy sufficient, electricity bill, bad for animal, bad for people. Roosgaarder uses unexpected sources of light in nature. They include microalgae and natural ink. This looks like a normal rock, nothing special, but it's actually embedded with a um, very special ink, which makes it light emitting. One of the projects we're working on is combining the notion of science and nature and working on um, glowing trees. So at daytime, it looks like a, yeah, like a normal piece of tree, but the moment we go to a dark space, it, uh, it glows at night. We developed a sort of biological ink, which actually enhances the well-being of the tree and doesn't harm it. And it charges at daytime and glows at night. And that would be enough for wayfinding or guidance to reduce the, the ugly, uh, polluting streetlights and to maybe bring back more trees and more nature into the city. That's the smart city, in my opinion. That's the future city. The UN Environment Programme estimates artificial light is increasing by around 2% every year. In 2020, the Australian government published a set of guidelines to mitigate the effects of artificial light on wildlife, astronomy and human health. While better light management is recommended, natural lighting is a solution investors are yet to explore. We should have trees that glow at night to replace street lights. Yeah, we should have light which is biological, you know, which grows exponential, uh, which doesn't have an energy bill. Um, yeah, we should have highways or bicycle paths which charge the daytime by the sun and glow at night, uh, reducing the light pollution, reducing the energy bill. That's the future. There's no way back. back in Tino's with Alessandro Bianciardi from Biomimicry Italia. How has biomimicry already helped shape the world we live in today? Well, uh, biomimicry definitely helped already in shaping uh, the world and uh, it will keep on helping in the, in the years to come. Lots of uh, uh, ideas inspired by nature are already among us. And for example, uh, the way we manufacture things. We learn from nature how to develop new chemical processes that are less uh, toxic for us and also uh, more friendly for the environment. Uh, for example, uh, we developed new sustainable material looking at how the shells they build their structure, creating new composite materials, which are very tough. We learn from the spider net how to make a new and more resistant uh, fiber. And uh, we also learn uh, to develop uh, urban water management system, just looking at how forests um, manage uh, water. And the list can go on. Going forward, what role can biomimicry play in addressing the challenges facing our world today? Uh, actually, nature seems capable of finding compromise amongst uh, everybody's needs 
within a planet with limited resources. So for sure we could find an integrated solution for challenges like water scarcity, food supply, and we will be able, for example, to build up a circular economy looking at nature or build up a regenerative society. We will be able to adapt also to climate change, for example. On an, an individual scale, uh, can we practice biomimicry at home, for example? Oh yes, definitely. <laughs> At all ages and with all the backgrounds. Material is available. You have plants at home. You have your pets. Absolutely. You just can take a broccoli, for example. You start to look at it, try, touch it, see the color, and try to imagine why it, the broccoli is like this. And then you can imagine, okay, what can I solve with this type of shape? And then you just let your creativity go. Thank you, Alessandro. Stay with us. When we return, we go to Sweden to meet an architect who thinks that when it comes to heating and cooling, termites know better. The termite nest is a sun collector. They are cooling the incoming air. Welcome back to Sustainable Energy. Today we're looking at how we humans have been inspired by and even mimicked nature. In Sweden, one architect took the inspiration to solve a school's ventilation problem from a rather unlikely place. Biomimicry for me is that we find a solution in nature that can be mimicked in the building over a city. I think this is the key for building the future cities. My name is Anders Nyquist. I'm an architect and I've been working as an architect since 1962. I think uh, Lagerbe School is a good example for showing the eco-cycle adapted building concept. I was inspired by the termites. Uh, it's a biomimicry idea, and I read about it from other parts of the world, from Colombia and from South Africa and some other places. So the termite nest is a sun collector. When the sun is shining on the tower, the nest, it heats up the whole uh, nest. And then the termites, millions of years, have been digging canals in underground into the termite nest. And it means that they are cooling the incoming air, for the temperature in the ground is lower than out in the air. And this is a system we have used here. So we have the air intake from the small towers in the buildings. So this is the air inlet and it goes down in the uh, ground, and then it's a canal into the building. And in the basement, the distribution of the fresh air is in the ground. When the sun is shining on the roof, the air will go slowly up to the chimneys on top of the building. And these chimneys are connected to the ventilation system from the classrooms. And it means that in the winter, when it's minus 20 centigrade, we can heat up the air up to plus two centigrade. And it means that we are saving energy. And this is also a part of the cooling system in the summer. A school can be a platform for education of people also in environmental matters. You can ask the school children in, in Lagerbe School and they know about the water, the energy, the material and so on. And that's so beautiful. I'm very proud of it, yes. Anders' uh, idea is to take the nature inside the buildings. Our system built on plants, and the plants capture the pollution. Here you can see, we take inside air to the filter and remove particles and dust, and in the bottom we had fresh air outside. We can reduce energy uh, consumption uh, for about 50%.
We bought 18 hectares of land and planned a village. We really wanted to describe how we can live in balance with nature. You can see the plan for the village. Here is the entrance and here is the plot. And now, after 50 years, read the program. Everything has been done as we planned from the very beginning. We have our own water supply. We have different kind of small-scale wastewater treatment things in, in the village. You can't get a change until you have good examples. And my little village here is just a good example. And Lagerberg School is also a good example that you can be inspired of. But we need to do projects and so people can feel them, touch them, smell and everything. Be inside the building and see how it's working. Then you can convince people to do it in another way, to rethink the way of living. That was an interesting energy saving story. How can biomimetic designs address the increasing demand for energy? Biomimetry can help us developing products that are more efficient. Not only product themselves, but the way we produce them and the way also we dispose or we reuse or we upcycle them. Uh, we have already several examples of how to make a more uh, efficient hydraulic system or we have, for example, uh, um, smart systems uh, to manage uh, uh, factories which uh, copied algorithms from uh, swarm intelligence, so the same intelligence that is used by ants and bees. Another way, actually, biomimicry can help us in uh, building up more efficient energy systems. It can help us also to uh, improve uh, technologies that are run with uh, renewable energy. We have examples, someone develop uh, more efficient uh, wind turbines, emulating the, the fins of the whales. Can biomimicry pose a threat to nature? I mean, by overdoing it? Well, biomimicry, it's a practice and is implemented by humans. There are examples of uh, biomimicry applied for uh, developing, for improving defense mechanisms that you can call them also weapons, okay? Uh, there is genetic engineering. So you can learn from nature to cure diseases, but also to make something not very nice. Um, so I think that there are two issues here that needs to be taken into consideration. First of all, your ethics. You need to develop ethics for the respect of nature, to preserve and restore nature. Secondly, you can use biomimicry not only to find solutions to problems, but to measure your actions against nature's principle. Would nature do that? And if your answer is no, then most probably you should act differently. What's needed now to make biomimicry more widespread? I would say two main ingredients. First of all, awareness at all levels, private and public sectors, about biomimicry case studies. And secondly, I think it's crucial to bring biomimicry in the educational systems. So from kindergarten up to the university, uh, the school curricula, they should embed somehow biomimicry uh, teachings. So naturally, they will be uh, interested in looking at nature and utilize nature whenever they have a problem to solve. They will consult the natures, and so basically it will become automatic for them. A natural reflex. A natural reflex, which hopefully at the end it will be able to develop again societies that are functioning like natural ecosystem. Thank you, Alessandro, for being with us. You're welcome. insects to whale fins to algae, solutions to make us more energy efficient might be right under our nose. More awareness of biomimicry could be good for the planet and good for business too. Well, that's it for this edition of Sustainable Energy. If you'd like to comment on this program or our theme this year, nature-based solutions, then do get in touch on Twitter at CNBC Energy. We'd love to hear from you. Until next time, goodbye.